Well, welcome all of you to the monthly meeting of the combined Pennsylvania Interfaith Power and Light and the Pennsylvania Jewish Earth Alliance. Um, I hope you all know by now that the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 was signed um, this past weekend. Uh, it's now the law and it was an absolutely amazing thing that we got there. It took us a long time to get there. It was a, it was a long battle. Uh, some people are celebrating, some people are disappointed, but I would just like to say it's a start, but it's not enough for a climate, emer for a climate emergency, and that begs two questions. One question is, how did we get to this point of divisiveness of a nation torn apart, unable to address the climate crisis? And the second question is, where am I as an individual actor? So I'd like to quote from a rabbi from the beginning of the 20th century who's very famous in the civil rights movement as well as lots of other places. Um, they're by Abraham Joshua Heschel who speaks clearly to us on this topic. Some are guilty, but all are responsible. When we take a look at the root of the word responsible, we see the word response. Where have we been hiding in the bushes because we are too distracted or overwhelmed by the climate reality to respond with active citizenship? What we thought was responsible citizenship, like cooking with gas and recycling plastic, is yet another marketing ploy backed by enormous fossil fuel profits to distract us from the real problem that they are creating with dirty energy and plastic, both of which are made from oil. The fossil fuel companies' plan B is to push more plastic on us and soot, and to offset the decline in their energy oils, uh, energy oil and earnings. We may not be guilty, but we sure are gullible. This strategy is cunning and easy to fall for. Nevertheless, nevertheless there is no easy way for us to excuse us from. And that's what this is all about, is making a response. What we can do to be more active and better educated. So um, in the Jewish tradition, when we reach a very joyous time, it's a holiday or a life cycle event that we're ha it's a happy one, we say a prayer. And I thought it would be appropriate for us to say this prayer. And the prayer is, blessed are you, God, sovereign of all, who has granted us life, sustained us, and brought us to this moment. And I hope we all take a moment to really enjoy what we've accomplished together. It's because of all of our efforts, our telephone calls, our writing letters, our talking to people that we really were to able to accomplish this. But yet there is so much more to do. And that leads us to our topic tonight of soot. Um, and the current standards for the deadly and dangerous particulate matter pollution or soot were set by the EPA a while ago. They're outdated and they're insufficient. It's time for the EPA to update their pollution limits to a much stronger science-based standards to ensure cleaner air for families and advance environmental justice and to protect the public and the health. So I can think of no better person to be talking about this than Chris Ellors, who's the staff attorney for Clean Air Council. Clean Air Council are, of course, the, the experts on everything having to do with air, pollution, people breathing in things. He's going to give us an overview on particular matter pollution or soot, what causes it, what individuals and businesses can do to reduce it. Um, and then we're going to be talking about the re recommendations for revised standards. And of course, there'll be time for, for discussion and questions. So we're very happy to have you, Chris, and please take it away. Okay. Um, and could you enable the screen sharing for me? Yes, I will do that right now. Yeah. Um, uh, first, I should uh, give credit to Nilly Dan. She is a chemical engineer who works with my office. Uh, she's the one that did most of the work putting together a slide presentation. It's about 18 slides. Um, five particulates can get very complicated very quickly. Uh, so we've tried to make it as easy to understand as possible, but we've given you a lot of links to link you to stuff showing that we're not, we're not just saying, oh, fine particulates are bad. You want to know why it's bad. What, where are the, what, what are the leading articles? Uh, what is the EPA saying about standards? That kind of thing. So 
we've given, we will have given you access to that in these slides. And we're happy to share these slides with you after the presentation. Um, so to start off, uh, we've got a nice little, uh, everybody can see this okay? Is this big enough, my slide? Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, we got a little little picture here. The idea here is that these are, what is particulate pollution? Well, you all uh, are somewhat familiar with, or very familiar with energy and climate change and global warming. That relates to impacts on the environment. Um, and you often hear public health and the environment. They're two different things, but they often overlap. I'm a pollution lawyer, so I deal with air pollution, water pollution, land pollution, remediation, that kind of thing. So I think about public health, people being exposed to things. Uh, and so particulate pollution, uh, you've got, uh, a chemist will tell you, you've got three phases of matter. You've got solids, you've got liquids, and you've got gases. So particulate matter is particulates, little solid particles that happen to be in the air, in the medium of air. And they come largely from combustion. And we're all guilty about this. It's not just big industry. And so the point of this diagram is when we drive our cars and our trucks, we're burning fuels. And you've got lots of things coming out. You've got gases, but you also have solid particles. And that's going to include particulate matter. Um, uh, we've got businesses, right? Our, our, our housing uh, buildings, they're burning fuel. So they're generating particulates. Any form of combustion will generate some sort of particulates. We've got industry in the background and the power plants. Power plants are a large source of fine particulates, but they're not the only source. You've got stationary sources, buildings, and you've got mobile sources, cars and trucks, and we're all responsible. And then you've got construction activity. That also generates particulates of a larger size, and we'll draw that distinction. But keep in mind, that's also going to be uh, contributing to particulates. Uh, what are the sources? Smoke, uh, wood stoves, forest fires, wood stoves, consumer behavior. Uh, I remember once telling a story, a, a, stu a student, I smell smoke in the building. And someone said, oh yeah, that smells nice. A lot of people love the smell of burning wood. Well, that burning wood generates fine particulates and that can have a, a harmful impact on, on human health and the respiratory system for reasons that we we'll talk about. Forest fires, we read about forest fires in California every year. There were some really bad ones in Canada going back about five years ago. Last year, the forest fires in California were really, really bad, presenting a safety threat, right? You know, it can kill, these things can kill people. Uh, well, what, one of the ways it can kill them is, is through uh, inhalation of all of that smoke. Uh, cars and trucks, we talked about that, power plants, et cetera, soil and dust. And we've got some links here. Uh, if you want to read more, and these are links showing where we're getting this information. So we're not just making this stuff up, we're actually have authority. Here's another uh, slide showing sources, breaking it down by, by sector. And again, the, the message here is that everybody is more or less responsible. You've got industry, that is stationary sources, which would include the power plants, but also manufacturing sources that burn fossil fuels. Uh, the energy sector would be our power plants. Industry would be the non-power plants, but uh, other manufacturing sources, transport, uh, uh, cars, trucks, buses, et cetera, residential, uh, you know, buildings have to generate heat, agricultural activities. Uh, the San Joaquin Valley uh, in the middle of California, uh, they've got a big air pollution problem for a number of reasons. You've got large populations in California that are driving their cars and trucks. You also have agricultural activity in the valley where they're burning fossil fuels and they're generating fine particulates. And it's also an environmental justice area as well. Um, so that's, that's, that's an example of why this is important. And then we got fires as well that I've, I've mentioned here. Um, what, what, what do we mean by particulates? Well, we used to regulate them. We used to call them total suspended particulates back in the 1970s. And over years, uh, EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency has has figured out that the smaller the particles, the worse they are for you. And I'm speaking very generally. The smaller particles that tend to bur bury, burrow themselves further on down into your, your lung system, your respiratory systems, and making it harder for them to expel, uh, and therefore contributing to respiratory impacts. And so around 1987 and then in 96, uh, uh, EPA broke it down into PM10 and PM2.5. And PM10 is 
is particles less than 10, 10 micrometers and PM 2.5 is less than 2.5. Generally speaking, we associate PM 2.5 with fine particulates coming from combustion and PM 10 as coarse particulates coming from mechanical activities. But the distinction is not that fine. There is some overlap in that. And then in this diagram, you can see this is a human hair and you can see the blue is the coarser particulates, five of them could fit within a human hair. And then the fine particulates, four of them could fit within uh, one of the coarse particulates. So this shows you how small these things are. You don't necessarily, you're not necessarily able to see these things, but uh, they, they can affect you. How can they affect you? Well, we've got a link here on the side. This is a journal article. And we've summarized all of the ways that particulates can have a bad effect on the health. Lungs, they can worsen your chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, reduce lung function. Uh, brain, uh, they say that it can cause an increase in strokes, cognitive disorders, neurodegenerative illnesses. Uh, there are other things, the blood, the vascular system, reproductive system. We have a wealth of information, a wealth of scientific studies about fine particulates and how they affect uh, the human body. Uh, to summarize this, I would say that there's a link between, a very strong and established link between fine particulates and cardiovascular problems, including heart attacks and strokes, and ultimately what EPA calls premature mortality. Um, here's a slide, uh, again, this is citing another article, diseases caused by fine particulates, 47,000 per year deaths, 15,000, uh, preterm low birth weights. Uh, we have a breaking down. COPD, stroke, heart disease, and lung cancer are all, all linked to, to fine particulates. Um, back around 1993, there was a study called the Harvard Six City Studies. And I'm actually going to pull this up um, so we can see this in better re resolution. We knew that fine particulates were bad before 1993 until some people at Harvard wrote this study in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this is linked in the material. And, and uh, Dockery and Pope, these two people, uh, you'll see their names, Dockery and Pope. Uh, they're prolific in the literature. Uh, Pope actually is trained as an economist. Uh, and they did these studies. And this is what you call an epidemiological study, where you study disease or illness in the people or in, in, in the environment or in the population around you. And what they did is they looked at six cities in the north, in the Midwest, uh, St. Louis, Topeka, those are the big names, Steubenville, Harriman, Watertown, and Portage. They look at six cities in the Midwest, and then they look at uh, the mortality rates. They get that information from hospitals, clinics, et cetera, et cetera. And then they tried to cor correlate that uh, with the level of fine particulates and sulfur dioxide. And this is, this is the scientific process. They look for correlation or an association such that there's a, a relationship between one and the other thing. And they try to establish what's called a linear relationship. And I can't really blow this up much further than, than I have. But the idea here, and I'll try to draw this, this little figure here, figure three, this, this is a line. Uh, these, these are different cities, S being St. Louis, T is Topeka. And you've got fine particulates here on the bottom axis. Uh, and then you've got the mortality ratio, uh, excess mortalities on, on the other hand. So it's a relationship between X to Y. The important thing is that there's a linear relationship between one and the other. And that indicates some kind of association uh, between the two things. Now, it takes a long time for the scientists to say something causes cancer, something causes cardiovascular problems, something causes um, uh, premature mortality. Uh, but EPA is on record as, as saying that. Uh, in 2013, when EPA came up with the current standards, uh, which are right here, uh, the current standard, uh, EPA sets standards for the entire country, and these standards are supposed to be protective of public health. And we've got something called the annual standard of 12 micrograms per cubic meter. So if you could visualize a, me a meter yard, a meter stick, uh, 
as a big cube with three edges and three dimensions and 12 micrograms of fine particulates. That's what that means. It's over averaged over a year. And it's a complicated averaging process that I don't need to get into it. There's also a daily standard because we know that there are not only chronic harms from fine particulates, but acute harms over a short period of time. And so we got a different number, 35 micrograms per cubic meter. So we allow a little bit more in the short term um, to accommodate for rises and falls. Um, in 2013, EPA concluded that there is a causal relationship between both long and short-term exposures to fine particulates and premature mortality. So basically, EPA said EPA causes premature mortality or it does. Not everybody realizes this kind of thing. Um, and it's very important to realize that burning stuff, combustion, generates smoke, it generates fine particulates. And those things have been established by the public health people to cause premature mortality. You also have a standard for coarse particulates. I don't really deal with this very much. Uh, this is a much higher number of 150 average over, of, over a 24 hour period. Uh, but those, that standard is, is also on, on the books as well. Uh, another chart here, uh, we've got, a, this is from an article where they took average concentrations over the course of 16 years. This kind of gives you an idea of what parts of the country tend to have worse fine particulates than others. So you'll see uh, down in uh, Southern California, uh, Bakersfield has some of the worst air quality in the country, the San Joaquin Valley. Um, they've got a big longstanding problem with fine particulates, decades long problem with fine particulates in California. Uh, Costs from a large population, it likes to drive cars and trucks, a lot of industry and a valley where they all could sort of settle down in the soup, soup kind of an air atmosphere. Uh, we also have a fine particular problem in Pittsburgh, uh, which is where I do a lot of my work in Allegheny County. Uh, you also have the Midwest uh, as shown in here. Uh, a lot of areas in the Midwest, the industrial Midwest, there are a lot of power plants in Ohio, uh, industrial facilities in Illinois as well. Uh, and uh, this little arrow here tends to show you what the annual standard is for basis of comparison. Um, every, every now and then you hear about the air quality index, the AQI, and you hear more about this in the summertime because EPA issues an air quality index alert for ozone, which is worse in the, in the hot summer months. But they also do alerts for fine particulates as well. And they've got a green code for areas where the air, for, for days when the, area is, the air is good, yellow when it's moderate, and orange when it's unhealthy for sensitive groups. Uh, those are basically tied to the annual standard. The annual is the distinction between the green and the yellow, and the yellow is the distinction between the yellow and the orange. It's not altogether a fair comparison because you do, you're comparing two different time periods, but that's how EPA sets the green and the yellow. So but the bottom line is I'm, I'm rather sensitive to fine particulates, so I tend to notice when there's an orange day, <laughs> excuse me, and I may adjust my behavior accordingly. Uh, Purple Air Network. Purple Air Network is, a, is an informal network, not an official monitoring network of the states, but um, people who get together, they have uh, little devices, maybe a couple hundred dollars for a device and they record data. And so this is the link to that network. And basically, if I click this link right now, you'll get to see what the air quality is like according to that informal network. So right now in the Philadelphia area, you'll see we got lots of green. Uh, these are low numbers. Uh, these are raw data of micrograms per cubic meter. So these, these numbers tend to show pretty good numbers for the day for us. So today it doesn't look that bad. This screenshot here was taken right after midnight. And generally speaking, after midnight, air quality tends to get better or around that time because people are driving their cars, et cetera. But not always. Sometimes you have air inversions. And this happens in, in Allegheny County uh, where you have the, the cool air and the warm air tend to get reversed and it traps fine particulates in. So sometimes you can have bad uh, air at night. Uh, every year, the American Lung Association com comes up with a state of the air report every April. 
Uh, and, and the ratings for our region in our urban areas are, are rather poor. Uh, in Allegheny County in Pittsburgh, uh, they've long given Allegheny County an F uh, and Philadelphia as well, they've given them an F uh, for daily and for annual exposures uh, for Allegheny County. Although recently Allegheny County's air has come within the annual standard, but that's only because of the pandemic. Um, and and not I, it's not very representative as a basis for saying that the air quality is now good. Uh, Philadelphia also tends to have a lot of bad air days. Uh, the bad air days tend to be in the large urban areas, but you could see Lehigh and Lancaster, you know, not so great grades for Lancaster. And we've got the link to the American Lung Association. Um, here's more detailed information from the American Lung Association. Basically, this top chart here looks at excess particle days. So this first chart looks at, the, at, the, at what people are exposed to on a daily basis. And so their passing grade here for the, for, for the, for the, the daily, uh, or the, the, sorry, the passing grade would be um, if you're below this black line, but they're above the black line, so they got a failing grade. Here for the annual standard, they were long in excess of the standard and thereby failing the annual standard. Now they fell below it for the past year. So technically they're meeting the standard, but again, that's because of the pandemic. Uh, it's not really very reliable um, and uh, more on that later. Uh, things we can do to protect ourselves, um, uh, common sense things. Uh, when the air quality is bad, you get these air quality alerts in the summertime you know, the recommendation is often made to reduce your time exposures. Um, exercising outside, people say, well, exercising is really good. So I'm gonna ride my bike through the streets of Philadelphia. Well, when you're exercising, you're breathing much faster. You're accelerating the intake of fine particulates. So that's something to also consider as well. Uh, and uh, busy roads and highways. Uh, one of the biggest things that I've noticed in Philadelphia the problem in Philadelphia is not so much a power plant problem, um, at least in downtown Philly, it's really a cars and trucks problem. And before the pandemic, I remember the traffic would come down to a crawl at noon time, and the buses would be sitting there and the cars and the trucks would be sitting there and the trucks would be idling. And all of that just generates the soup of bad air, fine particulates as well as other things as well. And so that's important to be attentive to, especially in, in the, the hot summer months when people are out and, and people are uh, engaging in all that behavior. Uh, take action, consumer behavior things we could be doing, uh, renewable energy, energy star equipment, that sort of thing, keeping vehicles in, in good order, uh, being more efficient. You heard, you talk about energy efficiency all the time for your climate change stuff. Uh, well, efficiency with transportation is very important too, reducing car trips, uh, reducing and eliminating fireplace use and wood stove use. Uh, again, people love to burn wood. Well, a lot of people don't realize how bad burning wood really is. Uh, and burning leaves and trash and other things like that also rather bad for fine particulates. Uh, and then finally, um, for the people, for activists among us, people who like to take it a step further from consumer behavior, uh, we have the public comment process. Uh, right now, uh, EPA is reviewing the national standards. Um, EPA's advisors have been saying, we need to lower the daily standard from 35 to 25 micrograms per cubic meter. And we need to lower the annual standard from 12 to somewhere between eight and 10. And um, recently, EPA said, <coughs> we intend to issue a proposed rule this August. That is this very month. I haven't heard anything yet, but there will be a public comment period on that. And they will get a lot of comments, probably hundreds of thousands of comments from the largest environmental organizations, from the biggest industrial companies to uh, the regular person in the state because that's the democratic process, that's how the public kind of process works. Um, finally, um, once these standards are set, it's a, it's, it's a misnomer to say that these standards apply to a specific plant or a facility. These numbers apply to the states, and in turn, the states have to do certain things to meet these numbers. 
So whenever uh, the state has to meet a lower number, they have to go back to the drawing board. They have to develop plans state implementation plans to see how we're going to meet these lower numbers. Uh, they may want to come up with newer regulations, and then they may want to look at their air permits to see what do we have to do to reduce emissions from such and such facilities so that we come into attainment with these lower standards. Um, every week uh, in the Pennsylvania Bulletin, there are notices of all kinds of air permits for sources of, of, of fine particulates and other air pollutants throughout the state and there are these public comment periods. And so that's one thing for any of the activists among you who wanna take it a step further, who feel strongly about fine particulates. That's how uh, this issue is taken up through these public comment processes uh, that happen um, on a weekly or a monthly basis. It's, it forms a very large part of what I do. I, I do a lot of commenting on on plans and permits and, and regulations and the like. Uh, and then finally, we've got a few other links in here uh, to other sources of information, the Centers for Disease Control, the EPA, the Air Quality Index, and NASA. Uh, so, so that's the present, that's the slide presentation. Any questions on any of that? Thank you, Chris, for walking us through what it is, what we need to do about it and um, understanding the science behind it. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation. First of all, I wonder if you could talk about the public comment process. You say you do an awful lot of it, but you're a professional in this. So how do people like those of us on the call do something like that? Okay. I might have to Google something, bear with me. Um, all right. For the EPA has something called the Federal Register. All right, and so here we go. Here's an example of a notice in the Federal Register and there will be links. What I will do when that notice comes out, Phyllis, I will undertake myself to send you an email to show you how to do it. Um, but generally speaking, this is how you would try to figure out how to do it. And it looks awfully complicated, especially if you're not computer savvy. I'm crossing from the Federal Register to something called regulations.gov. Um, and I mean, this, isn't a good, this isn't a good example because we don't have an open comment period on that. Uh, but there will be a place in, in this regulations.gov Oh, here we go, today. Here we go. I'm just picking something totally random with a public comment period. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just showing you how, how exasperatingly difficult it is to find this stuff. I deal this stuff. Oh, here we go, comment. Maybe this is it here. Okay, here you go. See this, this is regulations.gov. That's the website for all federal stuff. And then here's this little comment icon, you click comment. And so anybody uh, in the world can just type your comment here, blah, blah, blah. Right, and then you, go. all right. And then you can attach stuff. And then you tell them who you are and you let them know that you're not a robot. There are guidelines, EPA's got guidelines. You know, they don't want, you know, obscene statements, things like that. You know, you want to keep it professional. Um, it's nice to support it, um, but your comment, you should speak truthfully and accurately about things. Your comment could be nothing more than, I live near a, a, a bad industrial facility and I smell lots of particulates and no one's been doing anything about it. And I really think it's a time that you lowered this number and hopefully something can happen. Well, if you're speaking truthfully about your experience, that is a valid comment. Now, EPA gets flooded with hundreds of thousands of these comments. But if they hear from 100,000 people like that, well, you have a movement, right? You know, that's how the democratic process works. So it, it sometimes seems like you know, you're just a little guy and you can't really change things. But this is the democratic process. And this is how it works. Even for environmental groups, you know, EPA gets hundreds of thousands of these comments. Uh, and so, um, you know, you wonder, well, how much attention am I getting? Well, 
that shouldn't be a disincentive for doing things if you are otherwise inclined to do it. You know, if you've got a good something important to say, you've got some support, factual, legal, or otherwise to say, you shouldn't be discouraged about doing that. But this is the, this is the federal level. At the state level, um, all the notices at the state level are from the Pennsylvania Bulletin. And if you Google Pennsylvania Bulletin, uh, you'll see examples of notices. Um, and then they'll, um, here's the current bulletin. And uh, they'll give you Here. Bear with me here. I'm winging this plan approval. In the Pennsylvania Bulletin, it's the State Department of Environmental Protection. And what they what we think of as an installation permit is called a plan approval. And so in the Pennsylvania Bulletin, they have a section for plan approvals uh, for air quality. And I'm just pulling this up right here. And so here's an example of plan approval applications. And then they'll tell you notice of intent to issue a plan approval. And so this, when you see a notice of intent to issue a plan approval, that means we received the application. Uh, we're, we're intending to issue a, a permit, a plan approval, an installation permit, which would allow them to install a facility, which will release air emissions. And then they'll tell you, you know, when the comment deadline is, and it's usually 30 days from the date of publication in the PA bulletin. And then they'll tell you, sometimes they'll have a public hearing um, and then they'll tell you how to go and submit comments sometimes. Does that make sense? I know it looks awfully confusing. Uh, in Philadelphia and in Allegheny County, uh, this Pennsylvania Bulletin is only for the state DEP. But in Philadelphia, it's not the state DEP that reviews and approves the air permits. It's the City of Philadelphia Air Management Services. And in Allegheny County, in the Pittsburgh area, it's the Allegheny County Health Department. So for the Allegheny County Health Department, if you're in the Pittsburgh area, then you go to the Allegheny County Health Department's website, public comment, and then you search there and they give you public comment notices. And so right now you'll see they got, these are their per permits right now. Every month they've got a list of permits. This is what they've got in Allegheny County. Uh, and then um, right now they're working, they wanna redesignate the area as a, an attainment area for five particulates because air, the five particulates have gone down and so there's a public comment period right now uh, that I'm working on as well. So Allegheny County's got its own website. If, you go, if you're in Philadelphia and you're interested in these things, then you go to City of Philadelphia Air Management Services, AMS, Air Management Services. They're the agency with the City of Philadelphia. They're responsible for air permits. Um, and so you would fish around in here. And um, they do notices in one of the local newspapers um, as well. So here, for example, uh, these are just application forms. All right, so that's, that's the idea here. I don't have anything as precise for you on Philadelphia as I have on Allegheny County, simply because most of my work is actually in Allegheny County. It's not the city of Philadelphia. Um, I have done some work in Philadelphia, but uh, not nearly the amount of work that I do in, in the Pittsburgh area. So you got different layers of government. You've got Allegheny County, you've got the city of Philadelphia, you've got the DEP for the rest of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And then you have EPA, which sets these standards as well. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense, thank you. Anything that you would recommend that we specifically do? Any action? Uh, well, I always say uh, to people, I'm a, I'm a lawyer, not an activist, although I do work with activists. And I, I think for me, I find that to be a healthy distinction. I, I don't really see it as my job to tell people what I think they should be doing. Um, what I do say is if you feel strongly about it, 
you know, you should make your comments. I just say that they should be professional. They should be supported by the facts. You shouldn't just make stuff up. You know, you shouldn't be malicious, that sort of thing. You should, you should support things factually or technically if you can, but that support could be your own personal experience and your observations about, you know, what you've been experiencing and what you think. I think that this is attributable to this. That, that could be a valid statement, that sort of thing. Um, I, my, that slide presentation gives you a list of things already on things you can do. This, this comes from EPA. I can't really add much more to that. Um, you can go online and find more. Basically, the upshot of it is, is that the combustion of, of anything, fuels, wood, cigarettes, cigarettes generate particulate matter in addition to you know, 1,001 other bad things or whatever, right? Um, burning stuff is bad. It generates things that, high particulates that get into your respiratory system and it's not good. Um, for people like myself and others who have, um, who are more sensitive, it's worse. Um, I was wearing my N95 mask before the pandemic because I could not walk from suburban station to my office on 19th street without running into at least five smokers every day, back and forth. And it made me sick and I would retch and I would hack and cough and it would make me sick. And so I started to wear a mask uh, and the air quality in my office wasn't that great. So I started to use it there as well. Um, so I'm sure people on the bus used to look at me as if I'm kind of funny until everybody else started to copy me. Now everybody else is wearing masks. Um, hopefully one of the bright sides, if you can find a bright side with you know, this terrible pandemic is that there's a greater awareness about air pollution and, and exposure to things. Um, you know, because just as you're exposed to COVID from the spread of things in the air, you're also exposed to fine particulates as well. Um, and so uh, I see a lot of people now going around in public places without masks. Um, I'm going out now more than I have in the past and I've taken my mask off when I needed to. But when I don't need to, I keep my mask on. Um, I went to the rock concert last week um, and I saw people smoking inside the concert, right? So I keep my mask on, um, that sort of thing. Um, well, probably one of very few people to do that, but there were other people with masks on as well. There's a good reason to be wearing a mask. It's not just COVID, it's fine particulates. Anybody else have any other questions? And thank you very much. Thank you. I, I will circulate the, uh, the slide presentation to you, Phyllis, and then you can circulate that to your group. So Douglas commented that electric vehicles are a critical piece of cutting climate. Um, can you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, the idea about electric vehicles is, is that a non-electric vehicle is powered by fossil fuels. You're fueling up at the pump uh, and you're generating greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, et cetera, et cetera. With electrification, the process of the energy generation is upstream at a power plant where they're already doing it. And so you're sort of collecting the load. And so the idea is that there's a trade-off. Um, yeah, we're not too crazy about the power plants burning the coal and the fossil fuels as well. Uh, but the idea is that it's better on balance to have it being done through, electrific through the electrification process. You're still ultimately dependent upon fossil fuels, but it's a little bit more remote and tenuous. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So Niley um, so, uh, wrote in the chat that organizations like Clean Air Council tend to organize public appeals with details on how to submit comments and where to submit it and things of this nature. So they make it very easy for people to do that. 
Um, and a number of us have put in the chat that we're interested in getting them. So we'll just distribute these to people. And Christopher, you also mentioned that appliances, um, we should buy Energy Star appliances. If there was one appliance that people could afford to buy Energy Star, because they often cost more money than, 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 another, than others, than the non-Energy Star, which one would you recommend that the people make a point of making sure there is Energy Star? Uh, that's not really something I'm that familiar with. Uh, there are other people that know. Nilly, do you have any ideas on that? Does anybody here have any ideas about that? I imagine there are probably some resources online. Uh, maybe Consumer Reports has some suggestions. Any other questions or comments? So what did Pittsburgh do to improve their air quality recently? Um, generally speaking, during the past 30 years or so, fine particulates have fallen across the country. Sulfur dioxide has also fallen as well uh, for different reasons. Um, technology improves, people get smarter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there have been decreases in emissions from the power plants in Ohio. Uh, so when Allegheny County has been revising its plans, it has been um, in incorporating or accounting for emissions from Ohio and areas outside of the state when they do their modeling about whether they will attain these standards. And they rely very little on additional things that could be done with local industries in, in Allegheny County. And that tends to be a little bit political and controversial given you know, the nature of the industry that is contributing to fine particulates in Allegheny County. Thank you. So Niley says that she guesses, this is in reference to the question, if you could only buy one Energy Star appliance, which one would it be? She says that she guesses that the things that they use a lot of energy, like air conditioners, it would be more important to get Energy Star. That's really great practical advice. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Since we'll be organizing the September uh, meeting soon, any, anybody have any suggestions for topics that they would like to see on the agenda? We will be sending out the slides once we get them. So thank you. There were lots of excellent slides in there as well as lots of good information and, and places where we can be looking for more information. Um, so if the air quality is good tonight, let's all go outside now. We'll, give, we'll end the meeting a little early so everybody can enjoy the, the air quality and take a walk at, sens at sunset, which is occurring very soon. So thank you very much and um, everybody um, stay well, stay safe. Bye.